right, everyone. Well, um, the clock has chimed 11.30 a.m. And I see a whole bunch of folks have joined with us one by one, entered this space that we will turn into a living room for you. Here we are, we're gonna have a conversation about the future of work and creative economies. We are so happy that you joined us. My name is Matli Tadero. I am the panel moderator. I am an Ethiopian American, Ethio jazz singer, songwriter, and composer and cultural activist, and also chief of program at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, YBCA in San Francisco. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. As I said, this is our living room. This is our conversation space. This is a space for call and response as much as it is for dialogue and conversation. So if you have thoughts along the way, questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We would love to be in dialogue and call and response with you. And so as we begin our future of work session focused on creative economies. Let's have our beautiful, beautiful speakers introduce themselves. And I will call on y'all one by one just at this beginning stage. Um, let us begin with Lauren. Sure. This is one of those uh, Socratic method panels I see. No, um, Don't you worry. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm Lauren Ruffin. I'll start with an audio description. Um, so I'm a brown skinned black woman with half a head of shoulder length dreadlocks. I'm wearing a black knit cap and a gray uh, striped sweatshirt or sweater, whatever this is. I'm in a room that's kind of sparsely decorated. I've got a painting of a dark skinned uh, black boy blowing bubble gum behind me and a white dresser. Um, so I'm one of the co founders of Crux. Um, we are a movement of Black artists working in AR, VR primarily. Um, we also help folks, um, you know, since the pandemic, design um, immersive experiences that are intimate um, and social while being distant. Um, I'm also one of the co-CEOs of Fractured Atlas, um, which is uh, the largest association of artists in the U.S. And we spend a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, how we're working and why we're working and how we can create people-centered and human-centered organizations. So. Super stoked to be talking with a couple of my favorite people, and you know, Michael. By the time this is done, we'll be we'll be super tight too. So I'm I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. And how about Kamal? Oh, I'm so so excited to be on this panel. My name is Kamal Sinclair, and my uh, description is I am a mixed race African American Irish American uh, person. So my skin is kind of you know, tan, peachy area. Um, I've got uh, also a shoulder length, a uh, little bit past my shoulders, curly hair, um, brown, and then um, I'm wearing a red shirt with a black sweater, cardigan, and I'm sitting in a room with some uh, photos behind me of a show I did back in the 90s with Fractured Atlas before they became an artist services organization and they were still producing theater. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. I have some glasses on my face as well. Um, and I am the executive director of an organization called the Guild of Future Architects. This is a membership organization of people that are really kind of creating coalitions and collaborations to boldly imagine the future um, from a lens of justice and from a lens of beauty. Um, this is a home and a refuge for people that identify as uh, understanding that in order to be radically about the present, we also have to be thinking about how we are good ancestors today. And, um, and we're providing as much support we can for people that identify in that way to connect, collaborate, and create value for the commons. Formerly, um, I had the, the great pleasure of uh, being the director of a program called New Frontier Labs programs at the Sundance Institute. We got to spend some real uh, incredible time with an, uh, over a thousand artists working with their um, true passion for storytelling at the intersection of science and technology, like Lauren. So <laughs> just innovating and creating space for the way we make meaning in the world. So that's a, another kind of experience that I bring to this conversation. Thank you so much, Kamal. And Michael O'Brien. Hi, everyone. So unfortunately, I am off camera. I have some 
uh, business center restrictions that keep me from being visually recorded. But I am here with you in full spirit. And I love this starting of a, a visual description. I've never done this before, but I love modeling accessibility. So I'm really excited to be learning this. Um, so I am a six foot three tall guy with brown, brown skin, black man. Uh, with, well, I used to have locks. I'd love to describe myself with these long locks that touch my back, but two months ago, I cut my hair off. So I am learning to even reimagine and see myself with this shortcut. Um, I am regrowing them for those that uh, care for that piece of the description of the, my future. So a year from now, I will be relocked and regrowing. Um, I am wearing all white, actually, um, with a white kufi on my head. And I'm in a, I'm actually in an all white room. I just looked around. Uh, that has some art on the walls and has, um, and the art is, I love animals. So there's a whole slew of animals. I've got a cheetah, I've got a tiger, I've got an elephant up. And then I have a bunch of whiteboards around me because in true 21st century fashion, you cannot be a creative and not have a whiteboard somewhere near you, right? At some point, or a sketch pad, you gotta have something, right? Um, and so my work background is um, in the intersections of developmental science, and that includes trauma theory, but also the science of human flourishing. Um, it includes work and policy advocacy around issues of justice and equity, and more importantly, how do you operationalize that stuff? Because we got a lot of folks writing pretty letters and pretty statements, but if you can't map those values to budget line items and to procedures, policies, and operations, then we just got cute words and cute, you know, expository pieces of writing. And so I help people think about that through consulting work and through work as a fellow at a think tank here in Philadelphia called the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation, looks at metro economies across the globe. And I like to say that I look at the humanity underpinning metro economies. And again, how do you operationalize that uh, equity world uh, or equity life, right? And so, or equitable life. And so the last area of my life is I am director of learning at a nonprofit in Philadelphia called the Village of Arts and Humanities. The village sits at the intersection of arts and culture and community economic development. Been doing that work for over, they have, we have been doing that work uh, successfully for over 53 years, 30 as the Village of Arts, 30 plus as the Village of Arts and Humanities, but hearkening back to its origins, it was founded in the late 60s as the Ile Ife Black Humanitarian Center by a gentleman named Arthur Hall, whose belief was that if Black people had access to reimagine their history and their future through the lens of arts and culture, that he could do two things for the neighborhood. He could help bring them to the world and help bring the world to them. And he made good on all those promises and really co-designed and co-created with uh, a neighborhood in North Philadelphia was what was an early example of creative placemaking and really creative placekeeping, right? Because it was not about utilizing arts and development to invite people in to maybe we'll take over land. It was about keeping people in place and using that ideology to then help people really be anchored in an idea of place that's on the inside. And so we continue that work. And as director of learning, I oversee that work for folks 26 and under. And I also special manage a number of projects focused on the future of work and here to join my new friends in dialogue. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, thank you also to Lauren, yes, indeed, for modeling um, the modeling accessibility in a way that I hope we can all take on and uh, replicate as we move through our now very virtual meeting worlds. So I will add to that. Um, I am a black woman with a short Afro, it's about two inches. I am in a room that is yellow. That is a, it's a sound board that comes to a gentle, gently sloped point behind me. It almost looks like I'm at the, in front of the hull of a ship. I'm wearing a gray sweater um, with a sort of circular or oval neck. And I have silver earrings on that have two little circles dangling down that my mama gave me. Um, so uh, thank you once again to everybody who's joined us. And I see more folks have come in as we were um, doing our introductions. So I thought that I would start with a subject that is near and dear to my heart, but also one that kind of focuses and hones 
uh, arts, technology, and creative economy all into one um, through a lens of Blackness, um, as we are four Black people in this space together. And that is around Afrofuturism. And I was wondering if we could talk about Afrofuturism, and particularly as this, like, I think of it as this creative lens that once you sort of embrace it as a world, it can become a, a, a lens that, that informs many, many practices um, uh, and ways of working. And I know that all of you in very different ways are inspired by and really incorporate Afrofuturism into your work. And I want to throw that out as the first question and, and see where that lands with all of you. You know, I go for it. You know, I go for it, Kamal. Go for it, Kamal. Hey, I'm no, no, you got to on this one. This is um okay. Well, I have to I have to just pay respect to um allied media projects and particularly Adrian Murray Brown. Um I when I was at Sundance, we did a collaboration. We were able to um be at in 2015 at um the big you know allied media conference and Adrian was one of our panelists um talking about you know this innovation space and and this and moment that although I've always understood the power of vision and the power and particularly the the I grew up in, in a religious tradition where where we understood black people to be the, like the pupil of the eye where the black is the darkest part of your eye but attracts the light for the world to see and so this this black foresight this black insight has always been part of my kind of framework around you know the, the, this incredible um, contribution that Black people bring to our global society, not knowing that every group brings particular gifts to our to our global society in, in a way that humanity moves um, and, and changes and metamorphosizes. But um, it, there was a particular moment when Adrienne was talking that it just clicked for me when she talked about, you know, I grew up um, thinking a lot about multi-generational trauma and healing, but the way that she framed part of that healing that I hadn't fully understood in that way before was about when you when you can actually go through the process of envisioning a future that is that that what, what does it look like when black bodies are not in in trauma what does it look like when we're fully realizing our potential because we're not um having those potentials limited through systematized racism um and all of the other kind of um issues that come along with that and it was it was a moment that I, I, I kind of, it just really clicked and, and quite frankly did a, a change in my trajectory around the work that I wanted to be supporting. And also while we were at Sundance, you know, Moira Griffin, who was the head of our diversity program at the time, was really clear about saying, yes, we, we've done very well at advocating for the injustices in different ways around black bodies and trauma, um, black and brown bodies and trauma. But, we, you know, and I understood this from when we were doing Question Bridge. Uh, I used to be an artist on the project Question Bridge Black Males and looking a lot at, you know, the identities that Black men have been framed in throughout our history in this country and, and all the ways in which that is agended and, you know, politicized and how it has created implicit bias and all kinds of, you know, the whole, um, a, a very deep history of, of systematized social control and oppression. Um, and it was just this moment that, even at Sundance, we had this conversation around how when you are, even if your intentions are good and you're only showing images of black bodies and trauma, and even if you're trying to advocate for not having black bodies and trauma, it's still, it's, it's still part of the programming of all of our brains, our neurology, our psychology, that not only impact the way the world sees us, but the way we see ourselves and the way we perform um, in, in our, the way we program our all of our behaviors around the, this concept of blackness, and I it just was a moment where I realized that this is a really critical piece of the puzzle um, of making sure that we are creating space for for that bold imagination of what does it look like when black and brown bodies, black and brown people, black and brown minds, hearts, and spirits are not only imaged in um, deficit identities, um, and that is powerful paradigm shift if we can achieve um, those images um, as normal that it has such deep impact on even our epigenetics. So that's why Afrofuturism to me is such a critical movement at this point in our history. Uh, 
garbage truck outside of my house right now. So I'm just gonna. We can't hear Michael. it. Oh, you can't? Okay, good. Sorry, I've got a pretty intense mic. It picks up everything. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think yes to everything there, Kamal. Um, the, other, the other thing that I'd add is, in addition to Afrofuturism, I learned so much from um, indigenous communities um, and their stories. And in particular around, um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about cap how capital flows into systems. Um, and when we think about, you know, sort of economies and what we need to do with capitalism, um, you know, I'm informed by both sort of Afrofuturism and, and some of the work of indigenous communities to think about um, how do we get to a place where scale isn't the, the goal, you know, both individually and, and as collectives, as organizations, um, how do we get to a place where we really value relational um, these relationships that we're forming here that people in this room are sharing with us over the need to get ahead. Um, and how do we really start to ask ourselves, um, because capitalism actually demands that you don't ever take a breath to pause on what is enough for you personally. Capitalism actually demands that we ask, um, what does that person over there have and how can I get it? What does this person over there, whether it's my, my parents, my cousins, my teachers, or what do they want me to do? And then let's go into debt generally to go get it. Um, so, you know, once we start to center on our own personal happiness, which is radical, right? Like it is, it is a radical idea to think that what we should do are the things that make us happy as long as it's not hurting anyone else. Um, but really valuing the, relation, the, the relationships over, over money, um, making sure that the economy stays circular um, and that we're finding ways to provide everything that our communities need um, without having to rely on, you know, other sort of, um, you know, other metrics. For, for capitalism. So, I mean, that that's sort of where, where that question took my, my head. Did we lose Michael? Michael, did you want to spin on that or? Michael, you are muted. So, in true fashion of just technology 101, I just had way too many things open and like lost the screen and was like, where did it go? <laughs> okay, sorry, this is why you can't have tabs and browsers open. <laughs> sorry. So I agree with the brilliance and the wisdom that's definitely been shared. And so just to build on it and augment a bit, you know, taking a, a little bit of a different perspective from the end of like, I didn't. I knew Afrofuturism as Octavia Butler novels, of which at one point I had never read one, right? And I think I even shared this when we were um, preparing for this. It was someone else that you, a colleague of ours, that used the term futurist on me, and I was like, "What? What does that even mean?" This was like four years ago, right? Um, and it's interesting because it never dawned on me that there was like a collection of people and a space of thought and research and practice in the arts and all this other. Uh, not only just in futurism, but in a space of futurism focused on Black people extending forward in time uh, in, in, a, in, in a variety of ways, right? And looking at a variety of life outcomes and, you know, I call it social alchemy, right? The ways that people can relate with and be in relationship with one another. Um, and so uh, for me, I approached it through the lens of very clinical work, right? And public health centered work dealing with trauma, dealing with um, and, and research and practice in that area and looking at, again, human thriving and well-being and what are the, you know, I would call it technologies, right? That And not just like digital technology, but again, back to this idea of social alchemy, relationships, design of process, design of how people interact with one another, interact with space. What, are, what is the technology for healing in the 21st century that we really need to be keyed into in places and spaces like Philadelphia? And when jobs are such a necessity, are there ways to be thinking about monetizing some of that in ways that don't extract the true value and meaning from it, but can literally put money into people's hands in legitimate ways that, that support them having access to create right, family sustaining opportunities um, and so that kind of thinking I didn't know was Afrofuturism, right? And so I was excited to learn that not only is there a space for that, but there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people around the globe in our country thinking like this. And so to be in relationship now with you all, um, you know, to think like this and want to probe these things is very, very exciting. And I think it's opened up 
both in my practice of research and practice of uh, just doing, right? Uh, I think it's opened up ways for me to think about the future of work in ways that include, to Lawrence, but include indigenous wisdom and technologies, but is completely also centered on imagining ourselves 15 minutes into the future, which for some people and groups can be very difficult because of the immediacy of now and the stressors of now and the way that we've come to learn to manage our expectations because of the things that many groups are routinely having to navigate at the policy level, at the local level, whatever. Um, and then also imagining ourselves 200 years into the future, right? Like both are a part of futurism at varying scales, but are still a part of that world. And it's exciting to me to be able uh, to be in community to think about those things with folks and do, right? Not just think, but do. Absolutely. Uh, what, one of the... Go ahead, please. So just a quick quote that I think speaks to what, what you just shared, Michael, is by Zora Neale Hurston. And it says, the present was an egg laid by the past and had the future inside its shell. And I just think that's the perfect kind of analogy for, I mean, I, I would say, you know, <laughs> just thinking about how time works and, and what our relationship is to time, like you're saying within the moment, within 15 minutes, within, you know, a hundred years or so. So yeah, I just wanted this to amplify. And I love that. I love that as well. And I, I um... And I, I just want to reflect back some of the things that y'all said. Um, vision centered, a full vision of healed uh, black bodies not informed by trauma, centering indigenous wisdom, being happy, social alchemy, ways of relating that prioritize relationship over outcome and a real technology for healing. Um, I just thought that was beautiful. So many beautiful pieces came out of that. Um, discussion and also thinking about, you know, I, the reason that I wanted to start with the Afrofuturism question was I'm really interested in uh, a specific creative practice um, that can become a lens that focuses and directs our work, um, no matter what it is. So a creative practice that can do that for us, that can, you know, give us that kind of freedom and liberation to step forward and follow through and act. And I think Afrofuturism is um, one of those powerful technologies that y'all, as y'all said, but um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not only about a creative practice that can do that, but you all yourselves do that through your own work and creative practices. I'm, I was really struck um, when learning more about you that each of you are people who sit at an incredible breadth of intersections, right? Like, so, um, you know, Lauren, you're CEO, co-CEO of Fractured Atlas and founder of Crux, but you're also a lawyer and a founder and you've done PR and fundraising and you're focused on joy. Um, Kamal, you're a future architect, a dancer, a transmedia producer, a senior consultant, executive director. <laughs> Mike, you're a social practice artist, a musician, a professor, an innovation fellow, a trauma, trauma specialist focused on flourishing and development. Um, I feel like there's a real ethos in there, uh, a real, a real, a real ethos towards the polymath, towards multiple intelligences, um, as well as an ethos of like make it happen, do um, move, move forward. And I, I was wondering how you all navigate those intersections of creative practice, um, in multiple intelligences, ways of thinking, um, especially when. I still feel like that's quite um, well. Not only are not only um, something that's very I feel natural to the artistic and creative mind, but um, can can also pose challenges. But also, which poses so many um, potentials for the way we need to think to step into the future. So I just wondered if you could talk about um, how you navigate those intersections and also how you nourished those in yourselves. As you were saying that, I was like, maybe we all have a hard time making decisions and commitments. You know, like, <laughs> maybe, like maybe that's a commonality that I hadn't thought about. Um, but I mean, I think it's always struck me as like, as weird that we're taught to be like multitaskers and multidisciplinary. And then, you, you know, you, you, you know, you go from walking to running and and sort of trying out all these other things and then you become an adult and they tell you like pick one major in college 
um, you know, go to law school, pick, pick this one type of law that you're going to, that you're going to go deep with. And, um, I guess I never accepted that, um, because I'm really curious about learning new things and trying new things. Now, I mean, I think being brave enough to not push back on whether I'm a creative or not, which I didn't do officially yet, but it might happen before we're done. Um, but I, I mean, I think, I think the world demands that of us right now. Um, you know, this, where we are right now, as capitalism reaches its apex and may, perhaps we might be a little bit past the apex, I think we're going to have to be multi, multi, multidisciplinary, um, a little bit of everything. Like I've, you know, I feel like I've got to get better at, like, I'm starting to garden more, like more intensely, you know, like, I'm like, how do I do, like, am I going to have some sheep at some point? You know, I, I feel like it requires those sort of questions that are pretty far out, um, to really help us understand that we're navigating this world that really hasn't existed and it's happening in real time now. Um, and you know, if nothing else other than climate change is, is going to push us to become experts in areas that we just never thought we would have to, um, yeah. I, I have to second that. Um, I, when I, I got an opportunity to do a research project called, uh, ended up being called Making a New Reality for the Ford Foundation. And, and I interviewed all these people, amazing people. And, and Lauren, I believe you were one of those people, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so long ago, 2016. But yeah, and um, one of the things that kept coming up over and over again was how, and this is pre-Cambridge Analytica, pre-Facebook going on trial, you know, in front of Congress. And this was when just real people that were kind of in the, it was even like at the very beginning of like Tristan Harris doing this, you know, uh, Center for Humane Technology and like kind of this tech won't build it movement. And I just remember so many people saying we are designing into our silos and we're designing with these perceptual limitations. And it, and it was getting more and more and more dangerous. I interviewed one Silicon Valley executive who said um, the head of one of the major set, you know, kind of branches of a major tech company didn't even know about the civil rights movement in any depth or capacity. Mm -hmm. so those kind of limited, um, you know, we went steam. I mean, we went STEM in a way that was, you know, we're, we're dealing with the most abundant, complex, dynamic, technical infrastructure in human history. So it does require hyper specialization. But if you're only focusing on that hyper specialization and not understanding, at least in a cursory level, the other aspects of the human systems then we're definitely not designing well and not to the optimal, um, you know, the optimal design that could be possible, um, especially when you're looking at like the, we're, you know, coming to the end of capitalism uh, in the way that we know it and, and really needing to be bold in understanding um, that we can't continue in this exploitive nonstop growth capacity. There's just no more room to go anywhere. <laughs> like we have got to understand circular economies. We've got to understand regenerative systems. And so that's why I, I think it's, I almost like think about it like theater directors having to, at the dawn of film, having to like get in the room with somebody who needed to operate a camera or an editing or edit with, you know, what an editing machine might look like. It was just completely out of their, what would be the silo that they were supposed to be in, but in order for these new kind of ways in which systems developed, we needed to break out of it. So I, I, I think I'm working with a lot of um, universities, rethinking curriculums for interdisciplinary work, working a lot, we're, we're curating in and we're finding magic, um, kind of that alchemy that you're talking about by at, at the guild where we're bringing somebody who might be an ecology, the top scholar on coastal ecologies, put them in the room with somebody who is, you know, the a, a regenerative farming expert in the room with somebody who knows about VR and AR. I mean, stuff happens when you, when you create those mixes, but if they don't even have a language to be in the room together, we miss the opportunity for those serendipitous magic to be created. So anyway, that's my take on why um, intersectionality, not only from, you know, kind of demographic background and identity backgrounds, but also from fields and disciplinary backgrounds are important. Yeah, can I, I just wanted to add one thing, Kamal, because I think that's so spot on. Um, in particular around this idea, you know, sort of we made this big push on STEM and STEAM and that, that focus. Um, what we're realizing now in, in 2020 is that you know, um, things like having a sophisticated understanding of, of the systems of, of oppression in the United States is actually a core leadership competency. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you can't lead an organization in the future if you don't understand that history. So if you don't know that the move bombing happened in Philadelphia in 1986, and you can't, <laughs> you can't support employees on November 4th after the, this election, mm -hmm. um, because there's a direct line from state, san you know, from state sanctioned violence that, that predates the move bombing um, to two weeks from now. 
Um, and I think that's that whole that whole thread there, Kamal, was really tight. Yeah, I think that's a, um, like a fantastic point. And I think for me, uh, I think we, we're becoming experts, either silo styled or global whole level systems complexity style about everything but our humanity, um, which is fascinating to me and terrifying at the same time. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have not fully at a national level sat in the fact that every system essentially as we know it that has been designed to function at a macro level and by default then to influence a lot of the micro level systems and you know processes uh, and within our society uh they've all been built on the back of dehumanization right whether that's racism classism ableism um homophobia transphobia i mean we can go down a list there but the fact of the matter is we are steeping ourselves in so much knowledge minus to me what's probably the most robust area of knowledge coming forward i was excited to hear kamal talk about epigenetics right like there are so many areas of understanding and that are breaking forward in specific silos of research and academia that are forcing new sectors to emerge that are completely multi multi disciplinary, like the, the science of learning, which is like at least eight different siloed areas of academic research converging into one because of how complex it is just to be a freaking human being and to do something as quote unquote simple as learning, which is not simple, right? So making statements like learning is a bi-complex memory system is, is for many people kind of like recentering and like, oh my God, I've never thought about it like that because it opens up a whole series of other questions. How does this complex memory system work? How is it positively influenced? How is it negatively influenced? Does it, how, well, how does it interact with the body stress mechanism? We've got all these things to start talking about. What is it like to have systems of oppression running amok in the workplace and I'm expected to be learning and being upskilled and reskilled for a 21st century economy and nobody wants to talk about my blackness in a positive way. Nobody wants to honor the fact that I'm a mother and it's not a bad thing because if we'd have mothers, we wouldn't have humanity, right? Like, there are so many things that people have to go through at the intersections of their identities to just accomplish the quote unquote normative things in the 21st century economy. And we can now actually start to dig into these complexities and think about the, the real cost, right? And then so to your point around care, I use the developmental science frame for all of this, not just for care, but for even classifying constructs of harm, health, well-being, um cost risk and that's to look at humans as developing in four dimensions that uh, have inputs and outputs right and outcomes connected to them so that's the biological or the physical the psychological or the emotional the social or relational and the spiritual and or moral space but that last one is not about religion it's about the fact that human beings are meaning making creatures and we're going to make meaning even when there is no meaning like that's provided for us we will legitimately fill it up whatever the hell comes to mind based on you know our experiences the way we've been socialized larger media narratives family narratives I mean, it's just a convergence of things you know colliding in that space but you are going to make meaning whether you want to or not and you don't have a choice like that's the other thing about these dimensions of input around our development they're dynamic they're inner they're interdimensional they, they impact each other influence each other and you don't have a choice on like, okay, I'm only gonna focus on my psychological development. It doesn't work like that, right? And like as systems designers, holders, thinkers, architects of the future, policy makers, whatever it is, we've got to also consider that you don't just get to pick one area to impact with policy. That's not how it works either. Neither do learning spaces. So that complexity of our humanity, I just I astonished at how far behind philanthropy is how far behind policy making is how far behind like so many systems and players are how far behind the freaking future of work folks even are and considering this space that i'm talking about i, I spend more time in rooms with people yelling about automation and i'm like oh my god guys just do a lit review we've been screaming about automation years right there are so <laughs> many articles and periodicals about all oh, the jobs they're leaving and what really tends to happen is that new jobs pop up that we were not prepared for. 
We didn't prepare anyone to partner with technology in these new ways. We didn't prepare, and we have this opportunity now, and I'll close out here with my long statement. We have this opportunity now, go back to the indigenous wisdom piece. We are watching indigenous wisdom become sucked up into capitalism, right? Like, <laughs> we can stop that. Michael, oh, talk about that. <laughs> and do something that both lifts up humanity and provides real access for people to have wages connected to things that they know from a, from a place of being, right? As opposed to having to pay to go to school to get a thing or having to figure out more complex financial instruments to get somebody educated in some way with a degree and a, and a, a stamp of approval on them for us to have to then again realize that we really need to decentralize expertise, right? So anyhow. Well, uh, Lauren, you go next, but I have no, something. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, um, just I, I wanna piggyback on what both you guys have said, and particularly, you know, as, as Lauren, you brought up this idea of hyper-capitalism and kind of coming to this apex. Um, I think that, you know, circling back to, to what we started with in the conversation was why Black folks need to be in these conversations, why indigenous folks need to be in these conversations. And um, when, when I back, you know, when I was doing that interview, those interviews, I was talking to a lot of people about the future of work and, you know, all the kind of swing pendulums of fear to, you know, all, all the things were, were being expressed. But Scott Winati, um, who's an artist in Canada who runs Indigenous Futures, um, gave a, a particular answer that really stuck with me. Um, she's a uh, Mohawk Iroquois and she was saying, oh, I can't wait till there's a four hour work day, four days a week, because then I can go back to the balance of what my cultural, um, what is normal, what is, what is the, the kind of the, the cultural balance that my um, community, my culture has always, you know, identified as a balanced life where you're supposed to have time in work and service to your community that you're creating value for all of our mutual survival and, and thriving and shared prosperity. But you also have to have you know equal time with community and family and, and equal time in nature and equal time in creativity. And I was like, that was such an interesting, um, you know, bringing that perspective. And then when I think about um, uh, artists, um, I, I interviewed a, a venture capitalist um, who was talking about when there is no more traditional work, when the current, you know, it, 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 he was saying that when, when, all of our needs can essentially get met because of you know automation and all these things in partnership with technology. What what creates this driving force? And he was saying like in my um, his estimation, it was like the only people that work and and do things without giving either uh, time, money, or leisure were artists that worked hard for something that was intrinsically more valuable. And he was like I, he said he thought it would be the currency of the future. And so when, when I think about that with what she's talking about, and then I and then the last piece of the puzzle, and I'm trying to weave something together here, is this idea of you know equatorial communities globally who have um, lived in abundance as a norm over the history of you know you know obviously there's been all kinds of shifts and you know I'm not a geological expert on the different uh, you know proscenes <laughs> epochs that we've had uh, in in our history, but. You know, there there is um, a conversation where you know when you're in like when I studied cultural anthropology back in my in my undergrad, there was a particular um, tribe that we studied that you know was a hunter gathering tribe, and in the axiological system, the value system of that tribe, the more items and objects you had and hoarded, the poorer you were considered because you had to carry those things from one place to another, and there was an environment of survival that over time that community knew that they could shed and leave and let something de you know re recompost into the earth in one place because they knew that there would be the tools the resources in the next place but if you're coming from a scarcity based mentality where you know hoarding exponential growth and protection of object um, and that that need to get what the other person has uh, when there's a scare when there is a legitimate scarcity environment that model of survival has been so dominant that it has gone to a point of extremes and in moderation that is is obviously doing the opposite now where it's killing us. And so that's where marginalized voices like indigenous voices or equatorial communities, recentering them and how in a legitimate way, not in a tokenized way of like, oh, let's let somebody come to the table. But the reality is we need them at this, we need us at this table. 
um, because without those complex um, ideas at the table, we're gonna design into, continue to design into our perceptual limitations. So I just wanted to put that out there that I think artists have something to contribute because of the relationship that artists have to work that is something beyond just a transactional relationship and that um, people from traditionally marginalized communities have something incredibly valuable to contribute to this future of work. And does it, uh, and to your point, Michael, I don't think it is, I, I hope it's not just transferring hypermanic kind of um, activity to new types of jobs. I really hope that we can find a balance and well-being in that future of work scenario. Yeah. That's yeah, I think that takes a level of a, you know, boldness and intentionality, right? So one of the things that shocks people about what we're doing at Crux is, you know, we, we pay black artists $125 an hour for their work. Um, and folks are always like, that's a really high wage. And I said, well, that's what I, I'm not showing up for less than that. And I got to build a company that I'd work for someday. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think once you, once you start thinking about, um, you know, building entrepreneurial creative businesses, um, you know, we're really clear. Our sweet spot is, you know, having an artist work part time for us. Everybody makes a wage of around fifty five thousand dollars a year. And at the beginning of of twenty what next year twenty twenty one. Good lord, you know, we'll start offering benefits for folks at part time because that gives them the freedom to explore whatever else they want. Because we still haven't figured out that the gig economy has necessitated that we, you know, that we decouple healthcare, <laughs> like basic health and wellness from a job that is actually causing a good chunk of our health and wellness issues as, as black and brown people. Um, so, you know, I just think that like, you know, being brave enough and then folks like, well, you know, if you pay people too much, you might fail. And then I'm like, well, then next year I'm looking up and I paid black people a lot of money and we didn't work. Like what, <laughs> there's no downside to that. You know, like we fail cause we paid people too much bullshit. Like who cares? Um, so I, I just think like having, again, like, you know, living like having organizations that exist forever might not be the goal. Um, you know, your, your thing might not need to last forever, but you might, it might only be a year or two. And I'm actually a huge fan of time limited work. Um, because I think that keeps the energy in it. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling now, but off the soapbox, um, I just well, I think I want to people to do that. Yeah, no, I love what you just brought up and just piggybacking on that and the work. I mean, I think that's exactly right. We are, there's a project we're doing at the Village of Arts and Humanities that actually partners my um, consulting firm with my employer, which is a fascinating opportunity. And we have a funder that stepped in to help make sure we could do that in ways that's fair to everybody. But part of the goal is to make sure that we are modeling for people the same things that we're preaching and that if we're bringing in community experts right and by community experts i mean folks that are from a demographic that we're targeting this future of work project to part to benefit right like if they're going to come in on the project they're not getting a 25 dollars gift card the goal is 125 dollars an hour because that's what we would pay baseline any consultant and it's a way for us to model recentering of expertise or decentering certain kinds of expertise because the framework in basic research projects or the framework that we're told to use in these kind of design based initiatives is like you you stipend the community you give them a twenty dollar gift card to starbucks i'm like what that is just so wild to take someone's lived experience and the kind of wisdom that you don't get from reading books or doing grad-based projects you take that wisdom, you design with it, you make with it, you bring it back to them, you get more opinion, just extraction of value one moment after the other after the other, which we still haven't like really based in the fact to your point, Lauren, around histories of oppression, mm -hmm. that that kind of extraction comes from a way that we've been viewed as being part and parcel, cogs and wheels to the economic system, but not worthy of benefiting right. from the things that it produces and, and you know creates. And I think there's an opportunity for us to be disrupting that right now as a technology, right? Like that the, there is such a thing as disruptive, techno disruptive technology. We tend to talk about it in terms of products, but I'm also like process, process, process. And that's something that artists, and thinkers like us as multidisciplinarians, like 
we're able to bring that kind of framing to different things where people would never think about it. And it's not necessarily the most revolutionary idea when we bring it to those spaces. Like you said, it's not revolutionary necessary to pay someone a rate that you would want to be paid, except maybe it's revolutionary in terms of like the practice of just doing it versus like theorizing about it and writing equations and like looking at it in this abstract way and going, well, maybe one day in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, um... I really like that. Um, I love that practice. The practice of putting the values as actually institutionalizing the values in these uh, organizational processes that also once it's institutionalized, you don't have to be in the room to make it happen. Like it's in the DNA of the space and the structure. And I have to shout out right now, sorry y'all, I have to shout out um, our YBCA giving circle, our SOCAP artist cohort giving circle that was just launched this week um, because I'm so proud of being a part of this. Um, and it's and it's one of the ways at YBCA that we're trying to do exactly that. So we just launched on Monday. Um, I see some of the members of the giving circle um, talking in the chat right now, but we're um, seeding the giving circle with $250,000. These are artists who make direct impact on their communities, BIPOC artists from across the United States. And we're putting that money in their hands to decide what to do with that, how they want to um, become philanthropists, to, uh, to, to actually put the power in their hands to make the decisions, to design the giving circle. Um, that money is theirs and we're in a support role to those artists um, who are themselves changing systems, who are themselves every day in the trenches doing this work in communities around the country. But I just, I, I, I really appreciate what you said, um, Lauren, and also Mike about about the ways that y'all are um, making those turning those values into well one maybe it's like a, maybe it's the co making common wisdom into common practice something like that mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, thank you for for giving me the space to talk about the way that YVCA is approaching that right now yeah, I mean, as you're, I, I think part of the intentionality is understanding how the market's going to shift in the next couple of years and how we're going to help, how, how labor is going to be valued and how skills are going to be valued. We're, we're at that tipping point with technology where, um, you know, where we went from word processors, you know, let, let's say typewriters to word processors to Microsoft Word. Um, and we're still talking to black and brown kids about needing to learn how to code. Meanwhile, the no-code revolution is happening. So we'll have all these kids who know how to, how to code, but they won't be able to do anything because we're, we've already moved on to Microsoft Word. Nobody sets print type anymore unless you're trying to be really cool. Um, but that's what we're training these kids to do right now. And I worry about us not being intentional about how we value labor of creatives because what will happen is, you know, certain industries will develop and have a large number of black and brown folks in creative industries, and they'll consistently be undervalued. Um, and I just... You know, this the market's off to the races, and I, I want us to keep up. And I think you know, part of this conversation around wages is is requires a level of just seeing the future, I guess, um, and understanding how the how cyclical it is. Whenever we get into something, whether it's like wearing fur or, <laughs> or coding, it's devalued, um, and you know, it's 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 the it's a hard thing to deal with. So, so I want, I want to just even complicate that more. Well, one, I want to acknowledge that Lauren did a presentation at a certain foundation event a little over a year ago that really gave me language that um, if you want to talk about it so that you know, I'm not quoting you in front of you. No, you but, can do better than I will. <laughs> so, but, you know, really looking at how I think part of the fair, like part of the fair wage ask, issue is the fact that, you know, um, African-American families in this country are 225 years behind in the wealth gap than the average white family. Latinx are 87 years behind and Asian uh, families are um, 57 years behind. Now that's a couple of years old of a report on wealth gap. But when you think about a 225 year wealth gap, and then you go into environments where, you know, to get a leg in the door in certain, especially creative industries, you've got to work for nothing uh, at internships and you've got to, you know, take um, an entry level job at a prestigious nonprofit in the arts for like $38,000 a year in like LA or New York, <laughs> where like people are living nine, 10, 12 people to, a, you know, these tiny spaces to even survive. I mean, not that people don't need to pay their dues and they don't need to have, you know, all that part of it, but 
there, there's just a really clear, and we did a lot of, you know, just really wonderful. I mean, I, I would just say wonderful conversation, transparent conversation about this when I was at Sundance, like, why do you look around and we're mostly white women being able to do this work, you know? And that that's a big part of that is because if you're not paying a living wage for the city in which you, you're employing people, then you, people can't, they, they, they have to take a different job. They can't afford to take that, you know, that prestigious arts nonprofit gig for two years and then that catapults them into a studio gig or, uh, or something that would really catapult their career. So I, I just wanna, and I saw that happen over and over again, particularly in technology where, you know, and, and Lauren, you basically said you can't be an entrepreneur or even a nonprofit entrepreneur if you don't have the friends, family and pools round of wealth in your ecosystem to leverage. And that's why co-ops you were finding. You wanna talk about how co-ops were looking more I don't know where the yeah research. yeah I mean well you know co-ops serve they they serve a number of, of functions one it's it's immediate in, uh, input and investment from a community um, and you get to grow alongside the community at, at the same time um, but beyond that the level of engagement and commitment people have um, becomes a snowball effect in a cooperative and that's what we found because we we moved really really slowly for two years. Um, we've picked up in service to community, but we're finding that, you know, we're able to, in particular, um, recognizing how many um, brilliant Black people were laid off immediately uh, as, as disposable human capital at the beginning of the pandemic. We've been able to provide a source of income um, for, for Black and Brown um, creative workers that just wasn't out there before. But it's all because um, we're not trying to profit on their backs, their owners. Um, so there's an equity share that you have immediately the second you start working with us in, in the growth um, and bringing your creative projects and your brilliance into it. And, and that investment, I'm, I'm, what I'm, I'm thinking about right now is how do I put a value on that as an asset? Um, because it's not, it, it hasn't been marked yet and it's not quite patronage, but, but it's something that has value that again, isn't monetary value. It's not capital. Um, and I think that traditional, um, the traditional capital stack doesn't value that. So something to be said about the role philanthropy can play here um, because we need systems of transition as much as we're concerned about the future. The question that I have to Lauren's point is like, while we are figuring out the next thing that we could be doing or a couple of things we could be doing, like what would it be like to underwrite co-ops being developed in local black and brown neighborhoods where this 225 year gap is a serious thing and we don't have the friends family and pool around the capital etc this is where philanthropy can step in some of these endowments are so big so big that they could legitimately throw five percent of it away and still be here in perpetuity and this idea that you know oh we're going to give one percent above five percent as like our stretch I'm just kind of like, guys, that's just not okay in many cases, right? And I'm switching hats as someone who is on boards for local philanthropies in Philadelphia, and I'm doing consulting with some national philanthropies. And this is a conversation that we're having, like th this conversation around equity and justice, and we want to uh, be anti-racist, et cetera. But you want to do that through the methodologies and technologies that created the trash we're in. It's not going to work that way. The giving's got to get bolder. It's got to be more intentional to Lauren's point. And it's got to be directed and pointed in spaces and places where they, the risk they can absorb, right? There's huge risk factors that, that a lot of philanthropy, social impact funders, you know, if it's not traditional philanthropy, there's the philanthropic LLC is the new move in the 21st century, right? Where they can tuck billions of assets. So there are ways to be thinking about how to get capital to these places for the purpose of seeding, if you will, family, access to family sustaining wages and opportunities for people to generate family sustaining wages that takes into consideration issues in, or, or discrepancies in uh, you know, a wide range of diversity and abilities and the whole nine, but we've got to be thoughtful about what is this, or what are these systems of transition as we're maneuvering, you know, e even the moment we're in now, and the reason I keep going back to systems of transition, it was, you know, prior to six, seven months ago, it was by 2030, I believe that 70% of all jobs might be sucked up by automation, either 2030 or 2050, I think the stat was. 
Well, that's sped up enormously, exponentially, right? So much so that, the, uh, if you will, an atomic bomb has gone off in our, in our economy and we've got to wait till the dust settles to actually make sense of where we're at. And so people are talking about recovery and I'm like, the dust isn't even close to settling. In fact, it's only getting more complicated with fires on the East West Coast and all this other. So we need real thoughtful, sometimes 18 month, two year, interim solutions that are just, and I love Lauren's point, some of these ideas are not gonna to need to last forever. They need to be here now to address a real transition that is happening much quicker than people ever expected. We are losing industries left and right. And a bunch of these are the industries that black and brown people use just to get by. Yeah. And they're disappearing. So we don't have time and philanthropy has got to step up, yeah. traditional and non-traditional. Yeah, and Michael, that's so on point. Um, I just dropped a link to a book I read over the summer, um, Collective Courage. It's about Black cooperatives in the United States. Great read, if anybody's interested. Um, but I think philanthropy hasn't yet learned. I don't think philanthropy has figured out what the value is, what their value could be to Black communities. Um, you think about, you know, CDFI funding has dried up for our businesses. Um, banks don't lend to us. Um, but the reality is for so many black and brown people, the, the only source of capital we get in our lives is our, is the student loan that we get when we're 18 years old. They'll give you $250,000 to go to school, but won't give you $2,500 to start a business. Um, and philanthropy hasn't yet realized the, the potential they have to be able to see businesses. We don't get it anywhere else. Um, all the entire, you know, again, the entire capital stack has, has failed us, um, and and that that whole sort of you know the 225 years behind 285 years behind is is so spot on but um i mean to me cooperatives are the answer for us to be able to pull wealth um and and the structure it's been there for history so i mean it's not it's not a new idea at all um yeah but thank and, and you for that point to your, oh to your point let's think about resources beyond just cash mm -hmm. right um and, and like kind of those tangible I mean, we, you know, we, you guys were we were talking about you know reskilling, upskilling, like um, you know the, the 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 gap in skills basically. And you know, I was really struck by um, when I met a uh, gentleman Omar Wasso, who is a professor at Princeton, and he's amazing. Um, but he he I met him at um, uh, for a fellowship he was doing at the W.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard years and years ago when we were, and he was advising Question Bridge Black Males, this interactive media project. And he, I learned there that he was basically the, him and his, his collaborators created the very first social media site that was circular um, social media, not just chat room. And, uh, and that's what, what literally MySpace literally copied to go forward. It's, it, it, was, it, was, it was in the 90s, pre-Facebook, pre-Friendster, pre-MySpace. And um, it was called, it was Black Planet, right? And so when I asked him, I was like, man, that's crazy that, you know, Black people are so overrepresented on social media and you're a Black man that actually created social media. <laughs> I was like, and I said, is it, it, was there somewhere in the back of your head that you were calling on the African, you know, kind of ethos of call and response? And he said, oh, absolutely. I was trying to create a call and response website in the 90s. And when I think about, you know, kind of, where I, I did a compare and contrast between him and Palmer Luckett, who created Oculus Rift, and just in the, the levels of support and funding and where he was supported and where Palmer Luckett was supported in terms of, you know, really getting resourced on an exponentially crazy scale. And, 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 um, and I just think about that in terms of when you're talking about, like, the talent and, the, and like, also going back to this Afrofuturism and this narrative shift, like we're always being positioned as people that need to catch up when in actuality, in, I mean, he's a very specific case. He was on the cutting edge that got replicated and got you know, appropriated and then did not get the value out of that. So how do we also think about the future of these creative economies around justice and equity around not only the return on investment, because some things are not for, like even social media, I wonder if it had stayed in a place of, I mean, I don't know, I, it's all speculation, but you know, his intention was a call and response website. The social media we know today is 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 very much a, a capital instrument in a way that is not, you know, where, where we see, you know, uh, um, addiction design intentionally, like, you know, those kinds of things that were intentionally in, put into this system that was to keep people in a mode of addiction. That was not the original intention of, of what he was doing. So I just think about, you know, what, where do we also think about 
um, pulling the intellectual resources, the creative resources, the capital resources, um, and also protecting um, the appropriation of those resources. So I want to just call out that we have about one minute left in this session. And um, we unfortunately didn't get to many of the questions that came in the chat. But if y'all want to just, if there's any final words that you want to give on the subject, arts, technology, and the creative economy, we would welcome that. And um, just a couple of things in the chat in case it inspires some of those final comments. Um, Daryl Ratcliffe says, what are your thoughts on artists and creatives of color navigating digital divides and using platforms that aren't built by us? Is, are there any suggestions? Um, what are your thoughts on the art? Another, um, Michonne Boston says, what are your thoughts on the ROI measuring impact of philanthropy or grantsmanship? And, um, and Olivia Hauser says philanthropy could be a tool for reparations, but that's not the way it traditionally functions. Just a couple of thoughts to finish, if, if perhaps inspired by the chat. And if not, then we thank you. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I, I guess, Daryl, I think that's a really good question. Um, I was a lobbyist for a certain large um, internet provider nationally um, who were made nameless. Um, right when, when the digital divide started, um, when Verizon, sorry, I shouldn't have said it. Um, so I think it's complicated. I think there's history. I think the system is working the way it was designed to, which was to not build out um, high-speed internet to our communities. Um, those platforms, our infrastructure and how we use them is up to us. And I think for me, it's mostly, you know, are we aware of, of the fact that of, of the profit that's being made on us, on our content, on our voices, on our opinions, on these platforms? Um, and how are we getting compensated? Um, so, you know, one of the things we do at Crux is when we're approached by large tech companies for our ideas on feature requests, um, we make sure we're signing very, very narrow uh, NDAs um, because, <laughs> because that's a thing. Um, and then we talk about what compensation looks like up front um, because I know that we work with brilliant people and that they're going to have great ideas. Um, I don't have platforms to suggest because they're all pretty corrupt right now, um, but I think, you know, we're at a point where we have to organize for things that are better. Um, and that's my last word. It's just around how, around organizing and really calling on folks to, to do so moving forward. Think back on that, I, I think community benefits agreements, which is something that has been modeled in some in different environments, um, is in, in in ways very effective uh, for what you were talking about, Lauren. Like setting uh, setting some boundaries and creating um, some you know before going into a space where you're vulnerable to that type of exploit. But, but again, that's where you have like a desperation. Am I desperate for this money? Am I desperate for this gig? Um, if I am, am I going to negotiate away my rights? And that's part of what we need to be thinking about. And maybe these co-op uh, approaches is a way to make us less vulnerable to giving away our power and our resource so so for such low low um, prices. And I, I have to say, like we when I was at Sundance, we had an organization we were going to partner with. And they had to sign a, a community benefits agreement, and it was such an evolution for for us as well as for the community. It was just such a great reciprocal relationship of growth around these kinds of issues. Really quickly, the return on investment comment is actually our question is one that I spend a lot of time with, and both my consulting work and you know my involvement with philanthropy. Happy to talk offline with anybody about that. Feel free to hit me up. But it's a huge conversation because. Uh, people tend to have the right visionary outcomes as like a, a place to hang up things. Like, oh, we want great jobs and money for everybody, but they have no indicators on how to actually get there that make any sense, uh, particularly over like the 12 month, six month marks, right? Like from a public health perspective, if you're trying to tackle something like smoking cessation, you know it's gonna take three to five years worth of work before you're really gonna see the kind of outcome you're hoping for, like the large visionary outcome. But if you have the right indicators along the way, uh, it makes a world of a difference. So as a quick example, like I said it earlier, if you want innovation and creativity out of your workspace or out of your workers in a workspace, if people don't trust each other, it's not gonna happen, right? Because if you can't have free flowing ideas, you don't really have the creative thing popping off in a team. Uh, so how understanding those relationships and then reverse engineering your outcomes and the kind of return on investments you really should be looking for connected to these human centered outcomes is really important where I think philanthropy could really be making strides instead of that whole like, how do you end poverty with $50,000 in two years? Cause that's just stupid. Thanks. 
Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you for um, this really inspiring um, panel session. And thank you to everyone who joined us. It's been great to spend this hour with you. Thank you to SOCAP for having us. Be well, everybody, and have a wonderful conference session.